Hello and welcome to Backyard Farmer. I'm Kim Todd and I'll be your host for the next hour of answering those gardening questions. You can submit a question or a picture for a future show. Send an email to byf at unl.edu. Tell us as much as you can about your question, including where you live. Also keep in mind that we get numerous emails every week and it's impossible for us to answer all those questions on the air. You can search for answers in past shows or on the YouTube channel, Facebook, and Twitter. And as always, let's start with samples. Wayne, you are ready to roll. I am. I brought a selection of katydids with me tonight. Uh, first one here, this is one of our me meadow katydids. Uh, this is one of our mid to late summer ones that we typically see. Uh, we'll start fading away from those and we'll start hearing and seeing uh, the next three here. The middle two are types of angle wings. We've got a smaller one and a larger one right there. And then the last one here on the end, this is a cone-headed katydid, sometimes referred to as sword-bearing because the females have a very long ovipositor on them. And they are the ones that are the loudest that you'll be hearing here shortly uh, once we get into those. Uh, slightly warmer than what we've had the last few nights. Uh, they should be kicking on and there's a number of species that you can hear. Uh, and in fact, one of the loudest insects in the world is actually a katydid. Hmm. So for our listeners out there. Uh, it's not really a cicada that we would associate with the loudest, but it's actually a katydid. I like katydids. They just, they're, they're just. Yeah. And neat. for the most part, they're not a damaging part of our landscape. Yeah. yeah, excellent. All right, I had no idea they came in four sizes in the same color. Mm -hmm. There's even more. <laughs> I'll bet. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Dennis, a dead animal and plumbing. Yes. <laughs> so recently I've been getting a number of calls. Um, about rats, especially, because mice usually drown, coming up in bathroom stools. Um, and this can happen only where you have the sanitary sewer and the storm sewer connected as one, usually downtown areas, um, older areas where they have not been split. Or you can have this problem if um, you have um, a septic system and there's a break. Now, plumbers have designed several things that can help you that allow the items that need to go out of the stool go out, but something can't come back up. And these can usually be gotten through your local plumber and installed the same. So there is definite devices of certain ways that can stop the rat from coming up. So you don't become like the poor homeowner who called me last week and said, there's a rat in my toilet and I flushed and flushed and it won't go down. Because um, they usually swim very well and they don't go down. So um, what you have to do is try to uh, subdue the rat with proper leather gloves or some device and get them out of the stool. Because a good sized Norway rat can also plug your system. And of course, you, our audience can imagine the conversation off air about a rat in the toilet. <laughs> All right, Kyle, what did you bring? I, nothing to follow that up. <laughs> but, um, so I brought some, uh, some pine, some pine trees, a, a pine tree cookie, um, so just a little, a little slice that has some nice blue staining that's, that's occurring on it. And this is blue stained fungus on a, on a pine tree. And this is one of the, one of the um, characteristic features of, um, of pine wilt disease. And so we've had a lot of issues with, with um, evergreen trees this year, or they're just not, not looking all that good. And so as we're moving into the fall and winter and we're thinking about doing some pruning, if you cut up, open your pine, or cut, a, cut a pine branch off um, that's been, that was dead all year and you're noticing this blue stain, that's a good hint that there may be, that it may be infected with pine wilt. And so pine wilt disease is actually, um, it's caused by a nematode. Uh, so Bercephalanchus xylophilus is the name of the nematode. This nematode is moved from pine tree to pine tree by the pine sawyer beetle. And what the nematode does once it gets into a pine tree is it actually farms this fungus and will then feed on the fungus. So it's really impressive. We have four different organisms that are all coming together to cause this disease, which unfortunately can kill a 
a perfectly healthy, mature pine tree over the course of a year. Um, this primarily hits our, our non-native pines, so Austrian pines, Scotch pines tend to be the most, uh, most severely affected, but it can also hit some of our non-native, or some of our native pines as well, but the native pines can, can usually tolerate this injury um, and we don't see near as much damage. Unfortunately, not a lot of good control for this aside from removing that tree. So if you are no, um, seeing some pine wilt damage on your trees, we wanna make sure that that tree is removed um, really kind of by, by late spring. So we wanna make sure that it's out by, by April or May before, the, before those pine sawyer beetles have started to fly around to spread whatever, um, to spread the nematode and the fungus. All right, excellent, and it's really unfortunate to lose a big pine it, like that. It really is, and it happens quickly, about three months. <laughs> yes, can... it does. All right, first questions actually come to us from Evanston, Illinois. And this is Viburnum's, eight-year-old blue muffin. We had a blue muffin question, I think, last year. Uh, she thinks that all of, she's wondering, is this a Viburnum leaf beetle damage, and can this kill the viburnums completely after several years. So she hasn't seen critters on it. She does want to know what we think this is. Yeah, if, the, if they could back up to that first picture, if you look really closely at the stem, down towards the bottom of the screen, you see these little bumps mm -hmm. along the stem there. That's actually the egg laying masses of the viburnum leaf beetle. Oh boy. So that is next year's generation waiting to go Mm -hmm. and uh, probably removal of those might be a good idea to cut down on the population. Uh, I will defer to one of our horticultural folks maybe later, but as, it depends on how severe the defoliation has been as to whether or not this will take out the viburnum. Mm -hmm. so it, but get it, rid of the egg masses for get sure. Get rid of the egg masses yeah. for sure, uh, and then next year watch really close, for, on, especially on the undersides of the leaves, mm -hmm. for those larvae, and then treat accordingly. All right, excellent, thank you, Wayne. Your next one is, these worms are eating something, and it's only the flowers, and it's the petunias. What are they? Tobacco budworm, you can tell that by looking at the back, and there are those four black dots that form a square. That's one of the diagnostic characters of tobacco budworm. And your next one is, these worms have been eating the blossoms of our petunias. Same thing, just an <laughs> earlier stage. Uh, the other ones right. were a little more advanced. So, so the, the viewer, this one viewer says they sprayed seven about once a week and it doesn't even slow them down. How do you control tobacco budworm? Well, if they're on the newest growing parts of the plant, uh, you're gonna be hard pressed to keep enough insecticide on there, especially on a really healthy growing petunia to protect it. Um, maybe taking a year off to see if that'll help. But maybe you're just in a, the other thing to do is to not have lights directly above your petunias. Uh, that's a night flying moth that would be attracted to the lights. So maybe look at your lighting around your house to see if you have some lights on. All right. Light colors do play an important role. Yellow is less attractive. Hmm. All right, excellent, thanks. Okay, Dennis, yep. this is a viewer who says they've lived in his home for 44 years. He's never had a mole. Corner lot surrounded by two streets, two sidewalks, a concrete alley, the driveway, and the garage. Now he thinks he has mole damage with that hole in the corner there. What do it, we have? It's definitely not mole. Okay. It's either if he's in an area where there's a grain elevator or a downtown type area, it could be a rat, or it could be what's called a Franklin ground squirrel, somewhat related to the 13 line, but more looks more like a rat with a short tail. And they dig those holes that are about that diameter. They push out a lot of dirt. So it's one of those guys. And the best way to do it, you can try to discourage it by packing pea gravel into that hole and just pack it as hard as you can and then put the dirt over it. Um, or you could use a trap to try to trap that particular creature. All right. Your next one is a couple pictures of, this is a Japanese tree lilac planted mm -hmm. in 2018, tree thriving. She says the base looks strange with aerial roots, lots of holes. Yeah. It was planted shallowly and she did have a huge vole problem last winter. Is this voles or is, should she mulch? Should she fill the holes, ignore it? <laughs> well, I don't see any really vole damage. The roots look like they're all concise. Um, the big cracks are mainly due to dehydration, which if we, 
is a place where we got a lot of rain in the last week it, that should stop. But I would say definitely cover the roots with some soil and mulch um, properly done would probably be your best bet because I don't see any active vole. I see more cracks in the soil and all the roots look like they're intact with no chew marks. All right, and if she did have voles in a previous winter, should she protect the tree just in case with hard you wire could, cloth or something? You could, over the winter, put some plastic, make sure that it's loose, that you don't girdle the tree, and don't put enough mulch that you're making it look like a, a volcano. So put the mulch on the soil, but not up against the tree. Excellent, all right. Kyle, your first one is, oh, I forgot, we have one more, don't we, Dennis? So this yeah. is this is a North Platte viewer and found all these little things all over his boat cover and his chairs and his patio. He's wondering, is it an insect or is this a bat? Definitely not a bat. Bat would be much larger um, defecation or scat and it would be shaped a bit, a lot different. This looks smaller. I, I would go for some type of insect uh, droppings of some type and, and being by a river or something like that it could be in large numbers landing there and, and you know Wayne can weigh in um, on what it could be. There's a lot of things it could be yeah. um, especially that small yeah. It's, yeah. it's tough to tell. Um, there if they were in an area that got enough moisture which there are pockets in the state that have right. uh, it could be and when you talk about that small uh, little springtails yeah. yeah. All right. Okay, Kyle, uh, this is, I think, our very first impatience question of the year. Oh, I've been so impatient for impatience. <laughs> this is one called Healthy Sun, but it's wilting. Uh, they have a couple parts die in the same place in this display. They've used a seven insecticide in case it's an insect. The roots are intact. They're automatically watered twice a day. Too wet. Is this a fungus? They're going downhill fast. Yeah. So what do we think? Um, it looks looks to me like it is some sort of root rot, um, especially with the um, with the amount of moisture that they get. I would wonder about pythium root rot, um, especially as I kind of zoom in on this photo. It does look like there's a little bit of water soaking on the um, there there at the crown, um, kind of right at the soil line. And I'd be curious when, when pulling up the roots, if the roots are still intact and looking, and looking nice and kind of cream colored and white, or if they're looking more kind of brown and necrotic, as we tend to see with, as we tend to see with a lot of our root rots. Um, main thing would be, you know, if you've had the same issue in the same spot for a few years, I would probably recommend maybe thinking about something else for this display. However, if you really do want the impatience, um, anything that you can do to increase drainage in that area. So maybe re reworking the soil um, to, uh, to make it a little bit more porous or, or just cutting back on the watering will help, hopefully help. As far as this year, not a whole lot that can be done, unfortunately. All right, Kyle, thanks. Your next one is an Omaha viewer. So he says he came home one hot afternoon to find what looked like burned material in a hole in their yard about three inches wide. The grass is zoysia. Nothing was really burned and the charred stuff looked like coal, but it was easy to break up. And he's wondering, is there a fungi that will spontaneously combust? You know, that, that's, that's a question that I had never had before. So I spent <laughs> a lot of time looking about spontaneous combustion and, and fungi. And unfortunately, no, we, we don't have a unexploding mushroom or anything like that, which I guess is probably a good thing. Um, <laughs> however, <laughs> So I, you know, I don't think that that hole is. I don't think that the hole is um, is related to the to those black spots. I would wonder. I would talk to Dennis about it earlier about a potential critter causing something there. Um, but you know, I would think that those those black areas, to me, it, it looks like slime mold. Mm -hmm. And so I would wonder about how much um, how much moisture uh, you would have received earlier, maybe the couple of days before. Slime molds show up very quickly, and then once it dries out, especially in the hot, the hot weather that we've had, they will go from slimy to just crusty, and they can be all sorts of colors, yellow, orange, but we do get some that are nice and black. And then, yeah, we touch them, they just easily break apart. So nothing to worry about, um, but yeah, just something kind of cool to look at. All right, thanks, Kyle. 
Well, you know, most of us experienced a little bit of cold and rainy weather this week, and it was nice to be warm inside with something to eat. Well, mice and rats are looking for the same thing this time of year. You are going to need to keep them out. So here's Dennis to talk about keeping those rodents out of your house and your toilet. It's that time of year and we're thinking about getting ready for that cold weather. And so are all the rats and mice and they want to come in and be nice and warm in your home. But you don't want that, so you have to keep them out. And the best way to do that is exclusion, because once they get in, yeah, we can tell you how to trap them, but it's best not to let them in. Then you don't have to worry about going through all that trapping bother or figuring out what they're doing. So you need to go around your house now and look for any holes or any spaces you can find that are bigger than a nickel. Any slot or any hole that's bigger than a nickel you need to patch up, okay? So the first thing you need to do is go around the foundation and look around windows all the way up to the first floor because they can climb on the side of the house and cover up anything that is about a nickel. And what you're gonna do is you're gonna stuff steel wool and copper wool into all those openings that are bigger than a nickel all the way around the house. Now up underneath the siding, this goes right up, up underneath there in the corners, okay, to stop them from coming up underneath that siding. Also, along the siding, you can use any type of caulk or stuff it. Remember, don't use the caulk and stuff it alone. Mix it with your copper and steel wool. Now, they'll also try to come in where your dryer vents are. Protect the dryer vent, you can put one of these down to stop them from coming up underneath their dryer vent, especially rats and squirrels and snakes. You always have to worry about, especially if you're older part of town or downtown, rats especially coming up through the sewer. And these devices are great to be put into the stool that's, so the, everything can go out, but the rat can't come back in. Other things you may want to think about around the house is where you have pipes coming in and you want to make sure those are wrapped and you can get those the wrapped type of steel wool that go into the bigger holes okay and that would definitely get it so the whole thing is to going around and making sure there's nothing bigger than a nickel that these rats or mice can come in because they can squeeze and come right in those and if they're digging around the outside of the building again you want to use these mats and put it under the dirt. If you think they're digging down to get into a crawl space or foundation, this can go under the dirt or, or ra uh, gravel around the house. Now, if you have a garage door, that's difficult because the garage door is opening. You need to get, because they can chew through the rubber part of the garage door, right? So you need to get metal and put it on that rubber part of the garage door, both the bottom and the sides. This also works for patio doors because this rubber that stops the wind from coming out is great for wind, but rats and mice can chew that rubber. So you need to put the metal on that to stop them from chewing in and coming around. So biggest thing is to go around, patch everything up and stop them. Then you don't have to worry about catching them. It's a really good idea to regularly check around the house for those cracks and holes that those mice and rats are looking for. You do not want them scurrying around your kitchen or other areas, plug up those holes and certainly not crawling over your body when you're sitting in a chair. <laughs> okay, all right, this is La Vista, Wayne. Um, wonders what this really cool insect is. As he says it's approximately two inches long with pinchers. That's a short one. Really? Bigger. Oh uh, my. They can be about three inches. Uh, if you go down south, uh, they can get even bigger. Uh, this is a giant water bug. Uh, this time of year, I get phone calls about them, people finding them in their yards, cattle tanks, under lights. Uh, in the fall, they do fly around quite a bit looking for a new watering hole to infest and catch tadpoles, small fish, and other aquatic insects. All right, your next one is Osceola. They, uh, they couldn't figure it out and they wondered what this is and they found it on their acreage. 
This is another one of our aquatic insects that flies around this time of year. It's a water scavenger beetle. This is the largest version of this that we have um, based on the dime in the photo. Mm -hmm. uh, again, not something that we need to necessarily worry about in our All right. landscapes. Third one comes to us from Shadron, thick on the yarrow plants. And what are these? So this is a longhorn beetle. Uh, it does not the specific species does not have an English name, which is unfortunately rather common with a lot of our longhorn beetles, but this is Tragedian coccus. Uh, this one has just the two white spots on the elytra. This thing can have completely orange elytra. It can have those white spots from white to orange, and those spots can converge or not, or be located up or down the elytra. It's a highly variable insect and coloration. I actually made the identification really difficult. Thank you, Jody, bad, for helping is out. Is it a bad guy? No, most of okay. them are not. All right. Unless you're talking about the Asian longhorn beetle, and then we gotta worry. All right, and then your fourth one here is, um, this is outside Council Bluffs. They found it on their deck. So what's White that? dotted prominent. Okay. There, there's a group of moths called prominence. Uh -huh. And as you can probably tell why this one is called white dotted, mm -hmm. it's got the two little marks there on the mandibles, kind of makes it look like it has fangs. Mm -hmm. And that's the identifying character. They're real common with oaks. All right, excellent. You had some interesting ones. Very. Yeah. Okay, Dennis, uh, your first one here is a whole lot of pencil slash dime size holes under the linden. They're wondering if they're Japanese beetles or a critter, and they don't want to avoid poison, or they don't want to use poisons. They had moles that were encircling their rows of Sharon, so. Well, definitely not um, a critter. Mm -hmm. They're an insect. Um, and so we'll let Wayne talk about that one real quickly. Mm -hmm. um, what do you want to say, Wayne? Well, we, we talked a little bit about this before, and I just snapped into my head. These are probably solitary bee nests. Okay. Oh, okay. It's real common to have them in a cluster. Uh, there's some solitary bees that while each female digs her own nest hole, they will communally work in the same area, in the same species. So are they still there or are these just emergence holes? They should still be working in there. Uh, they typically plug them up when they're done. Okay. All right. So this, the same person's question also was, will moles eat beetles if those, or grubs or those kinds of things? No, well, mole, about 90% of a mole's diet is earthworms, mm -hmm. and the other percent is probably more ants because they're more prevalent in the soil profile. They will eat a grub, but the moles won't be after these bees, no. All right, your next one is a Northwest Lincoln viewer, wonders what dug this and is living in the hole. Seems like something pretty big. What is it and how does she get it out of there? That looks kind of like what we already looked at to some degree. Mm -hmm. That's either a rat or a Franklin ground squirrel again. All right, yeah. so kind of the same thing. Yeah. And then you have uh, piles of landscape blocks in a few areas and wonders what is making these holes. Yeah, that, so this almost looks like it could be washed afterwards, but it could be a, it's not granular, so I'm not thinking a cicada killing wasp. I'm thinking it could be a vole Okay. But again, it's not as typical, mm -hmm. but it has the right size and the right configuration of soil. For a bowl. And your last one of dirt mounds is what is making these big dirt mounds along some of the berms? Yeah, again, uh, I, I'm going with probably a ground squirrel, uh, a Franklin ground squirrel with that much dirt. Um, but again, I, I don't see the hole, so yeah. it's hard to say. Um, voles sometimes push the dirt out between rocks and you get the dirt looking like that. But it's, again, it, it, it looks fine enough that it's probably scratched and not pulled out by a cicada killer or insect. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't look like it's been moved by the mouth of an animal. It was definitely uh, done by the, the fingernails, so. Okay, all right, thanks. All right, your first one, Kyle, here is, uh, this is a Lincoln viewer who has blueberries and the, the shrubs are doing this on the foliage. Disease or environment? I think this is environment. I um, really wanna say this is just the natural blueberries response to, to the cooling temperatures that we've had. Um, and so we have the, 
the the exposed side of the of the of the leaves have um, they've had the colder temperatures and they just kind of turn that red or bronze color a little bit. Nothing to worry about. All right, your next one is a Creighton viewer, cucumbers, and for the last five years, she's saying her cuc leaves get these spots after they bear the fruit, and has it even though she took a year off from growing cukes. So um, I, I think this is angular leaf spot. Uh, this is a bacterial disease caused by, caused by Pseudomonas. Uh, Pseudomonas syringae is the name of the bacterium. Um, at first I was wondering about, wondering about downy mildew or potentially anthracnose, but I wasn't able to find any, um, any fungal growth on the bottom of those lesions, and so I don't think it's downy mildew. But this bacteria, uh, for the causes angular, angular leaf spot, it thrives in warm, humid conditions. And so if it's a garden that gets a lot of water, we've had a pretty warm summer as well. Um, makes perfect sense that it would show up. And unfortunately, this, um, this bacteria can survive in soil for about two and a half years. Mm. So one thing would be, would be crop rotation. And so if you are able to, able to move, um, move those cucumbers to a completely different part of the garden, that should help. Otherwise, if you would just maybe take, maybe take three years out away from cucumbers, which you probably don't wanna do, but that, that would be another option. Um, not a lot of great chemical controls for this, for this disease either, but fall sanitation always helps. So making sure that we are removing those infected leaves um, right now as we're doing fall cleanup should help for next year. All right, and your final one here is, this is in a garden north of Albion. What is going on with this tomato? Yeah, so it's just, uh, it's uneven ripening. Um, there are some viruses that can cause some uneven ripening, but typically when, if it's a virus, we get some blotches. When we have one side, it's most likely environmental. Um, tip, probably because of the, again, with the cooler temperatures that, that we've had, um, often we'll see this with some of our longer season um, tomato varieties towards the end of the year. And so um, maybe planting some, some um, shorter season tomatoes would help, would help uh, get rid of that uneven ripening. But it should still be safe to eat, but the green part will be hard and spongy and probably not taste very good. Unless you fry it. Unless you fry it. There you go. All right, thanks Kyle. Well, it was really cold and rainy here in Lincoln for a while this week, Despite chilling our bones, we needed that rain in the garden. So let's take a few minutes to hear from Terry James out in the Backyard Farmer Garden. This week in the Backyard Farmer Garden, we are enjoying some really cool wet weather. We've gotten two inches of precipitation so far this week. Really gonna help get our perennial plants ready to move into from fall into winter. The colors are looking fantastic. All of our fall plants are really performing and they're really gonna do well now that we have a little bit of extra rain on them. As we've talked, we've removed some of our vegetables that are done producing for the year. We've turned some of that soil over, we've added some compost to it and we put that cover crop of oats in there. So we're really starting to prepare our soil for winter and to get ready for next year. So stop by the Backyard Farmer Garden and check it out. Right, now it's time for the lightning round. All right, Kyle, are you ready? Let's do it. All right, this is a viewer who says their lawn is absolutely gone and they're wondering if they should put down a fungicide now. They think it's a fungus. Uh, I would not, especially if you don't know what it is, um, just Applying a fungicide is probably likely going to be a waste of money. Um, so we always want to figure out what's causing that lawn death before we do any sort of treatment. So right. no fungicides. So this is a viewer in Lincoln who says they have mold or mildew of some sort on their siding from watering. How do you remove it? Um, I would just get a little bit of bleach um, in, a, in a sponge and scrub her off. All right. The, there are several people who had the bacterial leaf disease on their lilacs. This is a Bradshaw viewer who is wondering whether the lilacs will recover and will this return next year? So they, they should recover. Um, likely it will return, especially if we, have, if we have another kind of cool wet spring, but they should recover. All right, uh, an Omaha viewer wonders whether stinkhorns are going to overwinter in the soil and reemerge in the same place. Yes, they will. 
<laughs> All right. We usually shred the leaves of oaks and maples and put them on the garden for the spread diseases. This is Grand Island. Um, probably won't spread any diseases to the to the garden. There's not a whole lot of diseases that affect oaks and affect your garden vegetables, so you should be fine. Excellent. All right, Dennis, you ready? Yep. This is a Hampton viewer who says they found bat guano in the barn and that's where they store the hay for their horses. Is this going to be harmful to the horses? Usually not. Bat guano it doesn't do much for horses. The, the defecation that hurt, hurts horses is possums. Okay. This is a Palisade viewer who wants to know how they can prevent their tulips from being eaten from underground in the winter. Well, if you can put fence over the top so nothing can get, dig down. And if you put it wide enough, it won't go underneath. All right. Uh, a Bennington viewer wants to know whether voles will eat the roots and the needles of their Norway spruce. Probably not conifers. All right. This is a Nebraska City viewer who wonders whether they, the humans, can eat vegetables that have been chewed on by animals if they cut out the chewed parts. Probably. <laughs> I do it in a second. <laughs> We have a Torrington viewer, Torrington, Wyoming viewer, who wants to know how to control voles. Use a catch-all trap. All right. <laughs> and we're done because you got me on all those. You did a very fast job. All right, Wayne, you ready? Let's go. You have a series of questions from the same viewer about the same insects, so this is kind of fun. The f and it's Marysville, Kansas. Do white flies overwinter in the soil? You know, I'm not sure where they overwinter, actually. Well, there you go. So her, the next question is, what should be done to house plants to keep from bringing the white flies in with the house plants? Give them a good washing down with the hose before bringing them in. All right. Um, she has used, or this is actually a different viewer, they've used imidacloprid for white flies. They want to know whether this is a good idea, and is it also a fertilizer? It's not a fertilizer. And it can work for white flies, but make sure you're rotating those active ingredients because white flies have been known to become resistant to imidacloprid. All right. This is a Lake Zarinsky area viewer who has a large bagworm bags on the blue spruce. What to do right now? Now, just pick them off. All right. We have a Bellevue viewer who found an ant-like creature, black and orange, quarter, one and a quarter inches long. Cow killer and they bite or no? Sting. Sting, Sting and they can also bite. All right, excellent, nice job, gentlemen. Plants of the week are, let's see if I can get this without having this in my face. So we have a couple things here. The first, the beautiful gold thing is one of our native goldenrods. This is one called stiff goldenrod and in the eastern part of the state, it's very tall and floppy in good, good conditions, good soil, good moisture. If you head central and west, it will stand up very tall in really poor conditions. Of course, pollinators love all the goldenrods. And the, the fuzzy caterpillar looking thing behind it is a grass that is one of our fountain grasses. This one is called, Wayne, redhead. <laughs> so it's this is in our backyard for these are both in our backyard farmer garden and this is a clump forming uh, one of the fountain grasses which of course we always keep our eyes on because they can throw some seed and get a little bit out of control so we have a goldenrod and a redhead here you do have an insect in there a soldier beetle mm -hmm. right yeah. goldenrod leather wing a goldenrod leather wing apparently <laughs> all right so, Wayne, your, your first set of insect questions this time. This is a Seward, Nebraska viewer that has tiny white moths on her poinsettias. And uh, they've been in the sunroom since Christmas, these poinsettias. So what is this? These are white flies. Mm -hmm. uh, again, uh, start with that hose them off. You know, the shower works really well for that. Mm -hmm. uh, to hose them off, get them cleaned off, and then watch them really closely. The Immatures can be controlled with insecticidal soaps. All right. Uh, your next viewer here is from Seward. She says small insects floating through the air and they're in the backyard. They look like small bits of paper. They don't land, but they're hard to catch. They're tiny and there's some that are kind of a light blue. Yep, these are woolly aphids. Okay. 
This is time of year we see them floating through the air trying to get back. A lot of aphids alternate hosts, so mm -hmm. that's what they're doing. All right, um, and then we have an Aurora viewer who is saying, what are these teeny white insects that are having the petunias for lunch? When I looked at this, this looked like cast skins of aphids. Okay. So this would be an aphid problem. Again, an insecticidal soap is probably their best run, or the hose. All right, excellent, thanks so much. Dennis, this is a Lincoln viewer who has, says the yard is lumpy and he has found what he thinks are two dead voles. He sent a couple pictures here. He put out two jaws traps and, and both completely disappeared. Okay, these are shrews that kill voles. Mm -hmm. And the first shrew looks like they have some ticks on them, mm -hmm. small ticks. But these are both shrews. You can tell by the purple teeth. These are Berlina brivicata, short tail shrews. And they actually are meat eaters. They eat insects. They love grasshoppers. And they're solitaire. And they use the holes of voles they kill and mice they kill. So you got rid of your friend. <laughs> and you got the, oh dear. You got the wrong one. Oh dear. <laughs> what would have carried the traps away? Probably, yeah, it's hard. It'd be something bigger, maybe a raccoon, maybe, you know, a fox or something along those lines to carry a whole trap away. All right. Your next one is a viewer in Blair who says moles have completely tilled the yard. They used the poison worm bait, but they took revenge by moving to the backyard. So how do they get rid of them and well, what do we do yeah, here? This looks like more than moles. This looks like more um, something like maybe a, a opossum or a raccoon or a skunk digging up the turf looking for grubs and things like that. Uh, the, it's pulled up too much to be moles. There might have been moles there originally when it was wet. Because you got to remember, moles like only moist soil. When it starts getting drier, then you get the bigger animals in there after the grubs. All right. Thanks, Dennis. All right, Kyle. Um, this is a broken bow viewer who has an oak and saw this kind of up there where the branch is split, six feet up. What is it and what should be done? It's hard, hard to give a definite answer on what it is. It's, it is some sort of canker, so most likely in that, um, that branch crotch there, there was a bit of, a, bit of an opening, allowing a fungal, of, allowing fungi into it. Um, and my thought was potentially Boltrospheria canker, but as far as what to do, I wouldn't do a whole lot. I would just keep an eye on the keep an eye on the tree. It looks the leaves on it look just perfectly fine, and so if it's continuing to hold leaves throughout the throughout the summer and dropping them at the normal times, and then leaves out well in the spring, I would just let it go and hope that the tree is able to fight it off. All right, your next one is also a red oak. This is Lincoln and all these brown spots on the leaves at the top of a 20-year-old tree. Yeah, so this really looks like tabacchia leaf spot. Um, it affects most of, our, most of our oaks and we'll tend to get these brown spots that can be, can be kind of pinprick size or, or they can be kind of larger blotches as well. Kind of confused um, with the fact that they're primarily hitting the um, the top portion of the tree, as this as this um, fungus hits often hits the lower canopy, but I would s still say it's a tabacchia. Really, nothing not, nothing to be too concerned about. It's purely cosmetic. All right. Then we have a viewer who wonders what the disease is that is on horse chestnut trees, and how do you control it, and will it kill the trees? And she sent a picture of the close-ups, too. So this is actually the sample that I was going to bring tonight, today, mm -hmm. but I saw these great pictures. This is Guiagardia leaf spot, um, or leaf blotch, on chestnuts. And it can, um, can infect all sorts of chestnuts, buckeyes, really everything in that, in that family often has those, those big brown blotches with a pretty large yellow halo around them. Um, it can look very similar to environmental leaf scorch, which, which chestnuts can get as well. But leaf scorch tends, tends to be more uniform across the tree, where it, as we have this kind of irregular blotches, it's Guiagardia. Um, nothing to worry about with this one either. It does get pretty unsightly, but typically by the time um, this fungus is active, the tree has already stopped its growing for the season, and so it's just going to be purely cosmetic as well. All right, thanks, Kyle. 
Well, many landscapes are complete if you add tall ornamental grasses to them. This time of year, they're towering over those landscapes. They sway in the wind. They're absolutely beautiful. With fall right around the corner, is it time to cut them back? Here's Elizabeth to tell us. There are many benefits to grasses in the landscape. They help to add movement, they can add an architectural element or an upright element to the landscape. And then they can also add winter interest and also they can add food for wildlife. But when we talk about care of ornamental grasses, there's not a lot that we're gonna to need to do. After we plant and they get established, they're not gonna require a lot of moisture or a lot of upkeep. The only upkeep they're going to need is to cut them back in the spring of the year. We let them stand throughout the fall and winter because they add winter interest. They also allow food for different wildlife and birds. There are some grasses that we would like to cut back um, in the fall of the year. Those grasses that seed very easily or very readily, like the northern sea oats or the penicetum, both of those can seed into nearby lawns and they can become an issue. So with those grasses, what we want to do is we need to make sure that we cut those seed heads off as they start to become mature, and that will help to prevent the seeds from dropping into the landscape bed or into the nearby lawn. Some of the grasses that you want to let stand during the fall and winter are going to be the Carl Forester that gives you a very upright element. You could also leave some of the native grasses to allow them to stand tall throughout the winter. And then also we want to leave up some of the large fountain grasses for a little bit of winter interest and a little bit of different element to the landscape. When it comes to our grasses, the more water they get, the more they're gonna flop open. So we need to make sure that the grasses get an adequate amount of moisture, but they're not getting too much so they don't flop open during the growing season. Over the fall and winter months, it's common for them to open up due to snow load or, or possibly even ice loads, and that's common. What we wanna do then early in the spring before they start growing is to go ahead and cut them back about six inches above the ground level and then remove that excess growth on top. Your landscape, those pollinators, and maybe even a few furry friends will really appreciate the winter interest and the food and the shelter that these grasses can provide. Just be sure to keep the ones that, that uh, out the ones that won't start spreading into the lawn, and some of them will do that, so watch those seed heads. All right, so our next round here, Wayne. Your first one <clears throat> is a Lincoln viewer and is wondering about any information about this beautiful moth. This is a Virginia tiger moth. Uh, it's the adult form of the yellow woolly bear that we will see, the white to yellow fluffy caterpillar. And um, when you fold the wings back on this one, you'll have white front wings and white hind wings, and there'll be a yellowish orange stripe going down either side of the abdomen. Excellent. And then you have another one, and this is a Springfield viewer. She found this on a, a pillar, and she she wonders if it's camouflaging itself on that white pillar. <laughs> it might be. Uh, this was another uh, one that looks very similar to the Virginia tiger moth, but this is actually a salt marsh moth. Uh, this one, if you were to fold those wings open, you'd see the white front wing, and then it would have those orange hind wings with an orange abdomen. So a lot of color up underneath these things if you fold them open. Or... And their larval stage of e either of these, is it? damaging or is it? Yellow woolly bears can be a problem. Uh, I've seen them problematic in rhubarb patches, hmm. defoliating. Uh, they can be a problem in some of our agronomic crops as well, if they're in high enough numbers. Oftentimes when they get in those high numbers though, they get hit by diseases. All right, thanks so much. And your, your next picture is, um, this is Dorchester. This is a stump of a hackberry house. So apparently turned the hackberry into a a gnome house and got and, and he's saying now it has this wet ooze coming out of it and all these little worms and it smells like death. The the joke here is maybe the evil gnome moved in, but <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> in this case, uh, this is what we call pleasing fungus beetles. <laughs> I know odd names, but 
<laughs> and I don't come up with them, I just repeat them. <laughs> and so these things are in that stump because there's a fungus growing. So it's one of Kyle's friends in there mm -hmm. making its way through that uh, dead wood. And these beetles are uh, laying eggs and then the larvae are feeding on that fungal growth. Uh, in fact, we actually had one of these beetles on a shelf fungi that was in here a couple of years ago uh, that was brought in for Lauren. And, I was poking around at the underside seeing some feeding damage and sure enough found one of those adult beetles. So they're just doing their job in the old gnome stump. Yep. All right. Even if it does smell like death. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Dennis, your next yep. one here, your first one here is a Sarenville viewer. She wonders what kind of a lizard this is and how she could get rid of them. They're mowing, they're on the sides of a couple of older wood sheds and they move very fast. Yeah. So and you've got a second picture, I yeah, think it's a different The lizard. first one is a skink, and the second one is a race runner. Okay, and this is Pierce County, the second okay. one. The, the race runner, um, Spicellus sixlineus, the six-line mm -hmm. race runner, and then the skink looked like the northern prairie skink. Um, there's no reason to get rid of them. They eat insects and they cause no harm, carry no germs and viruses, so there is no control for them. You can't trap them. Let them be. I don't understand. They're just good. <laughs> People are just maybe afraid of them or something. How could you be afraid of them? <laughs> I'm, I, I don't know, actually. I have no I, idea. I, it, 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 it founds me. <laughs> um, I'd rather have them in my house than my kids. Um, <laughs> they don't eat much. They don't dirty. <laughs> they don't yell. <laughs> And on that note, your next pictures. <laughs> the first one actually is Pierce County, and they think this is a Plains hognose snake. What it is. can you tell them about it? What does it eat, et cetera? Do they travel in the, packs? And no, it? they don't travel in packs. No okay. snake travels in packs. They are all solitaire. Uh, they only take care of their babies. Um, again, harmless, feeds on toads and small mice. Um, they, if you grab them, they will possibly play dead. They don't have a bite, and again, they don't carry any germs and viruses transmitted to us. Um, they're fairly common across the western part of the state. All right. And they will hood out or fan out like a cobra, and that's just to tell you I'm bigger, please go the other way. Okay. And don't hurt me. And, uh, and the reason they have the hog nose is to push the toads and lizards out of the sand. Oh, interesting. All right. Then we have a Fremont viewer who found uh, this one on the back patio. She said it curled around the hoe. She didn't think it was a bull snake, but she wasn't sure. No, it's a fox snake, and it looks like the hoe got it. Mm. Um, yeah, it, it's a fox snake. It's a rodent feeder. It eats rats and mice. So it doesn't look like it's going to get rid of your rats and mice this year. So mm. good luck with the rats and mice. Remember what I talked about. Right. <laughs> Let those snakes eat them. Yeah. Right. All right. Thank you, Dennis. So um, this one, Kyle, is interesting. Yes. We had uh, the viewer sent in a while ago about this fungi that was on the base of their jade plant in a container, and they rogued them out. Their question now is, you know, what really was this, and will they need to replace the soil, or is there a treatment for this? They're they're a really big jade plant. Yeah, so really it's, this one is very interesting. I think the I think in the um, in the question they maybe even use the term alien pods mm -hmm. for for what it is. Mm -hmm. And originally when I was looking at it, I thought was wondering if there were two different mushrooms here, whereas the the ones that are on the on the right with the the more white um, st stems that we can see. Those look, uh, those look like the, like the late oyster mushrooms, um, Sarcomyxa serotina is the um, scientific name. And those are just perfectly fine. They're, they're probably not harming the jade, the jade plant at all. They are um, colonizing some of the woody tissue, but really they're, they're just there, um, so I, I wouldn't worry about them. The other ones had to, had to ask a few colleagues, um, and we think that these, the ones on the left, the more bulbous, kind of larger, strange looking ones, we think those are the same, um, the same late oyster mushrooms, the uh, sarcomyxa um, fungi. But 
potentially infected with another fungus. And so mm -hmm. likely infected with an ascomycete fungus that's causing it to kind of bulb out and balloon like that. If possible, I would love, love, love to, uh, to get my hands on any of these alien pods. So if you are roguing them out, um, go ahead and uh, please send it, send it into the uh, plant and pest diagnostic clinic. So do they need to replace the soil if they rogue them and give them to you on, around this big old jade? Or? It's, um, you know, replacing the soil would probably help, um, help but Again, I, they're, not, they're not causing long-term damage to the jade, so I really wouldn't worry about them. All right, then we have a Westphalia, Iowa viewer, loves the show to begin with, and she thinks this is a truffle. She found it around a 100-year-old pin oak and found two of these. She thought she was stepping on a golf ball. So what, what is she seeing here? Um, I, so if these were truffles, I would expect to see a little bit, um, not, not as smooth of a, not as smooth of an outside if they were, if they were truffles, maybe a little bit more bulbous um, skin or epidermal layer. I think these are common puff balls. Mm -hmm. um, and so those are uh, lycoperdon is the scientific name for these. But I would bet if, especially on that first one, if you would have given it a, a little squeeze, you would have just gotten a big puff of dust that came out of that pointy end. Mm -hmm. um, puff balls, very common, especially hence the name, the common puff ball. Um, we do see them, see them quite a bit this time of year. They, they do love the moisture. You don't want, to, um, some puff balls are edible, but there are puff balls that can also look fairly similar to some, um, to some poisonous, poisonous mushrooms as well. So, Again, whenever we are looking at mushrooms and thinking about, about consuming them, we want to make sure that we know exactly what they are and that we've had the experience um, and the expertise in mushroom identification before we fry them up and try to eat them. All right. Thanks, Kyle. Well, a couple of announcements of things going on in the gardening world. And the first one is our Grow Big Red virtual learning series is continuing. This one is incorporating cover crops. You can register at go.u nl.edu slash grow big red virtual Tuesdays at seven o'clock through September. Our second one is still digging deeper with Backyard Farmer. Watch us on Facebook right after the show, eight o'clock central time on Thursdays. Follow Backyard Farmer in NET Nebraska to be able to do that. All right, we have just a little bit of time for a couple of questions. Uh, Wayne, this one is they, th they have a perfect line of what looks like wood shavings along the lines in the concrete, little tiny wood shavings. They think it's an insect, like little tiny sprinkles of shavings. Is this up against the house or it's, is it's in It's in lines in the concrete in the garage. In the garage? Yeah, any ideas on that? Or is that a stumper? Well, one, I'd want to know if they're doing any woodworking in the garage. Yeah, it didn't sound <laughs> like it. And, and, yeah. and two, could it be pavement ants and there's just sand under the could concrete? Be sand. And it looks like yeah. wood, but it's sand that pavement ants are bringing up? Because they do, they do typically put sand under construction because yeah. it levels nicely. Right. Right. Uh, so that's one option. The other thing would be look up above and see if anything's happening up above. Okay, all right. Do a little digging, in other words. One way Not or through the, other. the concrete, though. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Dennis, this is an Omaha viewer in Chaco Hills area. They've trapped 20 voles, six mice, using a live track following your advice. Worked great, fill, filled in the holes, and then saw some more. So <laughs> they're wondering what makes an area desirable for voles? Is there ever an end in sight? And we have about 30 seconds. Um, <laughs> probably not an end in sight, unless you have you have snakes in your area. So that would be the end to the voles, is getting some snakes. Um, but their population is cyclic, and rodents are noted to be resilient. And so the best answer is, they're, depending on if you're not in a cement-locked location, you're you just, it, you'll have to be resilient as well.